Hi Sherry, Logan, and Casper. Welcome to my uh, reflections on the course video. I took some notes down about what I was going to say on a Google Doc, so let me go ahead and switch to that. And we'll just get right into things. Ah, so the first question is, in what ways has this course influenced how I understand my discipline? So I really enjoyed the first few weeks of class where we were um, engaged in the debates about like what math and science actually are and what it means to be doing science. Uh, and because of these activities, I felt like I was able to like dive deeply into what it means to be engaged in doing science. And this was the first time where I ever felt um, in FSU Teach so far in my college coursework that pulling in math and science together was actually helpful and beneficial. I know a lot of the times in CI or in the step classes we kind of separate the disciplines because we're looking at it from like more of the teaching side of things and less of the theory side of things but in this class I felt like it was actually really helpful to look at STEM as a whole. And the two uh, pieces from the class that I wanted to talk about were the Umbrellaology activity and the show and field reading. Um, so the Umbrellaology activity um, I thought that was really great helping me think about the disciplines um, because that was the activity where we were asking ourselves and we were discussing as a class you know what does it what actually defines a science and I think, feel like we just had some really great discussions about whether or not we thought looking at how many umbrellas people carry or where they carry their umbrellas was actually a science or not. In the show and field reading, um, the biggest takeaway, of course, from that one was that can mathematics be defined as a science of patterns? I thought that also engaged us in a really great um, class discussion and that, um, I know I talked about this in my toolbox, but I would almost um, consider using the umbrellaology activity in my own classroom and the mathematics is a science of patterns discussion was also really great. I feel like that can be used maybe in a mathematics classroom. Um, but for the specificity of environmental science, to me, to me, it has always really felt like how the hard sciences like chemistry, biology, and physics can be used in like more of a wider view concept. So like taking a look at some of Earth's some of Earth's cyclical systems such as the water cycle, carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle, and how those systems, you know, can impact the environment such as you know, like the study of meteorology, weather, of course, geology, um, so like the physical earth and oceanography, how our um, oceans work. And so I feel like these or those disciplines all fall under environmental science and that they're comprised of the sciences such as chemistry, biology, and physics. Uh, just for example, like a geology example, we can't study rocks unless we understand the chemistry of the minerals that make up those rocks. Um, that's just a kind of an example. So the second question is, um, in what ways has the course influenced my teaching? Um, I think that this course has really developed how I think about my teaching, as in I now realize how truly important it is how I choose to conduct a classroom, how I choose to design lessons, and just how particular and individual that something I'm doing can have such an impact on the lives of my students, not just educationally. Um, and I definitely feel like how you conduct a classroom, how you design lessons, how you interact with students is now more than ever something that should be developing throughout your entire career as a teacher. Um, so sp specifically with regards to this class, uh, my eyes were really opened as we began to talk about colorblindness and the issues surrounding um, that facet and also the gap in schools. Now I, now I just choose to refer to it as the gap instead of an achievement or an opportunity gap because I feel like, I definitely feel like a achievement gap is the very literal um, term, um, but opportunity gap as we looked into is more of a real uh, definition of what it is or, or why the gap exists is more of an opportunity gap. But what we see and what, what the media sees 
is an achievement gap. With that regards to teaching, um, I thought the Nasir video and the Unconscious uh, Bias podcast from Harvard, I thought those were two really great pieces that I wanted to include in my reflection on the entire class. Um, the Nasir video really talked about classroom culture and how like the way that students are bringing their culture into the classroom and how we have to be able to respond to that as teachers. And the Unconscious Bias podcast really bounced right off of that and talked about, you know, why it is that teachers are like doing the things that they're doing in classrooms with regards to culture, you know, because, you know, we're human and we have these unconscious biases, which are these learned behaviors. I now realize that teachers play a central role in equity in schools, and it starts with the things that they've probably never noticed before, right? Um, so such as where they're standing in a classroom when they're lecturing, or how they perceive nonverbal language of students. So that's touching a little bit about, um, or touching a little bit on the discipline issues that we see in school, like the unequitable um, disciplining of different groups of students, and um, how we can be subconsciously um, marginalizing in our own classrooms you know we we saw the example of the one teacher who was she didn't even know it at the time but she was standing in front of um, all the students of color that were in her class because they were all sitting in like one area of the classroom so um, those are just things that were really brought to my attention and I wanted to include them in my reflection their question is in what ways has this um, has this course influenced how I understand learners? Um, I really like how that question is phrased with the word learner instead of student. Um, I think that's just, I think it's a much more inclusive word. Uh, the word student can like really kind of puts like an image of your mind at like a child sitting at a desk. And I feel like learner just opens up our minds more to realizing that it doesn't always like it's not always like one student sitting at one desk you know there's there I and I personally think it should be like tables of students sitting together um, but I just like the word learners instead of students um, so I wrote here sometimes I think that we get so wrapped up and by we I mean teachers trying to make ourselves better for our students and our learners that we don't stop to take a minute to realize who our students are and what they're bringing with them to the classroom. So taking a look at all of the ways we should be incorporating our students, our students' interests, culture, and experiences into our lessons, although that may seem like a daunting task, it's completely necessary and can be done in small steps to make your lessons and teaching more effective. And the two pieces I chose to include uh, with reference to this question are, of course, the culturally responsive teaching article and um, just a little bit about anchoring phenomena as well. So the culturally responsive, responsive teaching article I now realize is something completely essential to this course. And I know that we couldn't have brought it up right away in class. Like it couldn't have been something that we talked about during week two or three or four. And we had to leave it till the very end of the class because we needed to develop the knowledge and develop the discourse in order to be able to talk about it intelligently. And so, but now I realize, now I know that the culturally responsive teaching document and specifically the eight teaching competencies for culturally responsive teaching are 100% essential. Like I, when I'm ha when I'm a teacher and I have my own classroom, I want to like print out those eight competencies on like big giant pieces of paper and post them like on the wall. So I, it's something I think not only teachers should be aware of, but I think students should be aware of it too. And I feel like there should just be this really great communication between learners and their teacher and how they're conducting their classroom and their lessons should be something that everyone gets to participate in. Um, I know that seems maybe a little like whimsical and things like that and like I'm you know just dreaming but I don't know. The culturally responsive teaching document is it's just I feel like that one 
Like, if I could only take away one thing from this course, it would be the culturally responsive teaching document. Okay, uh, but on anchoring phenomena, um, specifically maybe the tanker car video, um, I feel like that was our best concrete example of anchoring phenomena. I know we also had a lot of really great articles surrounding anchoring phenomena, and with a special reference to NGSS, um, I talked about a lot of those in my toolbox, um, but anchoring phenomena is definitely a topic that we dived into and talked about, you know, how important that is for students that we provide them with an, an effective anchoring phenomena that gets them engaged in the lesson and makes the learning meaningful for them. I, I'm really excited to, to, like, find some anchoring phenomena that are not only like interesting for students but like culturally relevant um something i want to find anchoring phenomena that just like makes students want to change the world i want i want to find anchoring phenomena that like touches students hearts i want them to like have this passion for science that i do and i know it may seem like i'm being whimsical again but oh, i just I guess I just have these grand plans in my head that I can't wait to put into place. Um, it's all very, I don't know, <laughs> I'm excited. And then the last question is, in what ways has the course helped me understand myself? So what a deep question, and I feel like I don't actually know how to answer it, but here goes what, what I was able to type out. Um, so I said that changing how you teach starts with taking a look at yourself and understanding what has led you to the type of teaching you have been doing so far. I think a lot I think a lot about my college career and how far I've come. All the time I think about it. And I think what I've started to come to terms with is that I just one of the things that I've come to terms with. There's a lot that I've thought about obviously over the course of the past three years but one of the most important and salient things especially for my chosen career path that I begin to think about is that I no longer have an obligation to just ride the wave and believe the same things that I was taught in my upbringing. I am 20 years old, um, soon to be 21, I'll be voting this year in a presidential election. Um, there's, there's a duty and a responsibility for me to now seek out my own thoughts and perspectives on salient issues not only relevant to my career and my path, but things that can just make me a better person, um, such as, you know, presidential elections and things like that, but I think at this point in my life, I really have to decide, you know, how I want to develop myself because I'm my own person now. And I think that that is a really hard thing for a lot of college students to do and to come to terms with. I know it has been for me, but I just think about how lucky I am to be in a program that has fostered this kind of critical thinking about oneself and to have thus surrounded myself with other intelligent individuals with which I can have these hard and many times um, socially uncomfortable uh, situations and conversations like the ones that we had in class but I also now find myself having those conversations you know in the resource room or just you know you know, people come into the office and ask questions, and I just am so, so lucky to be in this program. And I think, I think that's a big takeaway from this class that I've been able to realize that. The last thing I said when I, uh, in this question about myself is that I've really honed in on the idea that you can learn so much from listening to others. So one of the huge parts about having these conversations, these difficult conversations that can develop yourself in a critical way um, is learning to listen because you can just learn so much from the people around you. And just, 
just so lucky. So then some of our last questions here are like a shift to the more just opinion questions. Um, the greatest difficulty I experienced in this course. Whew, okay. The greatest difficulty I experienced in this course was building an argument in my paper. My HP and E paper, of course. And I don't think I had ever been challenged with writing about something what seemed simply but yet so critically and in that way I I didn't know how to formulate my own thoughts on the opinion on the topic like I had so much love and passion for what I was writing about but I didn't I almost like I didn't know how to play devil's advocate with the topic and Another challenge was um, finding um, literature to reference for my topic, and maybe in hindsight, I might have picked something a little too broad. Um, picking an entire discipline was, it was not easy, and there's a lot, I feel like, that I could have done differently. Um, but I made it to the finish line nonetheless. The greatest success I enjoyed in this course. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, the people that I was able to take this course with. I think that's another one of the things that we're uh, lucky to have in FSU teach is small class sizes. And so I was able to take this course with people that I had taken other FSU teach and other content area courses with before. Um, and specifically, I enjoyed being able to rely on my classmates for conversation, um, something that I've been practicing myself is not always being the forerunner when it comes to starting conversations or participating in discussion. I had always had a difficulty allowing other people to step up and lead a conversation, but in perspectives, I was able to play more of a listening role, listening and responding role. And I feel like many of our in-class discussions, especially before uh, COVID-19, allowed me to practice my restraint. How would I describe this course to future students? I would describe this course as knowing and learning part two, where perhaps in knowing and learning, you talked about what you know and how you've learned it, while in this course, we talk about why you learned it, and is everyone actually learning the same thing in the same way? Um, in this course, we ask challenging questions about equitable teaching, a topic that's introduced in the STEP classes and developed, definitely developed a bit more in classroom interactions. But I would say that knowing and learning is more of a theory class, and perspectives is a how can we put those theories into action class. Is there anything that I would like to share with future students? My one very simple piece is never be afraid to ask for help. Whether it's about your paper, one of the readings, or something on a discussion board that you don't quite understand. Reach out to your classmates, your instructors, or fellow FSU Teach students that have taken the class before. Now note about that, since we had kind of a brand new setup to the class this year, um, talking to fellow FSU Teach students about what was going on in perspectives at any given point was brand new information to them. So I think that's also something that allowed us as a group of classmates to be able to lean on one another and develop those relationships because we we were all going into this as newbies and we didn't, you know, we didn't have those opinions and thoughts from previous students who had taken perspectives. It was all brand new for us. So I think that was something extra special. Um, but back to asking for help, um, I think sometimes, or many times people think that asking for help is a sign of weakness, um, but I know it to be a sign of strength. Knowing when to ask for help and where to ask for help is truly admirable and a sign of inner strength. Hopefully future classes will have just as an engaging experience as our spring 2020 class did. 
So that's all I have. Thank you, Sherry, Logan, and Casper for an incredible semester, um, despite all the coronavirus craziness and the Zooming and the everything else. I hope that we weren't all too much of a handful for you, and I truly look forward to seeing you all in the fall. Thank you so much.